Welcome to Chapter 18, Practical Applications of Immunology. This chapter fulfills objective number four, yet again, and once again this particularly covers um, interactions between microbes and their host, microbes and human disease. In this chapter we have two basic topics, vaccines and diagnostic immunology. Under the category of vaccines we're going to talk a little bit about history, types and characteristics, and safety. The history of vaccines is also the history of smallpox because that was the first disease that we were able to create a vaccine, an artificial active immune response. So smallpox, if you're just to get it, you have a 50% chance of dying. That's an average. There are some times when smallpox um, epidemics went through and more people survived. There were times, like when the Europeans brought smallpox to the Native American population, when you had something closer to an 80% fatality rate. So smallpox was not to be messed with. There was a practice that began in China called variolation, which was to take a scab or pus from smallpox, from a smallpox patient, and if it was a scab you dried it, ground it up, and then sniffed it up your nose. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? But that reduced your possibility of fatality to 1%. So once this caught on, it moved throughout all of the known world. Uh, people were really excited about this. Um, once vaccination took over, that decreased it to less than 1%. If you round it off, it was a 0% chance. So let me tell you a bit about how Dr. Jenner uh, developed the vaccine. Um, cows would get these pox, these pustules on their udders, and milkmaids would get them on their hands. And he's noticed that when smallpox epidemics went through, they didn't get sick. So his thought was, well, what if I uh, do kind of a variation on variolation? Instead of taking pus from a smallpox, pustule, let's take one from a cowpox pustule and purposely inoculate that into a patient and see if that provides infection. Well the first patient that they did it with, this is back before they had animal testing, here in the picture they've taken pus from a milkmaid and they're scratching it into the arm of the little boy. And he didn't get smallpox when it came through. Now at the time they had no idea how they were providing per, uh, protection. They just knew that they were. Um, later on we will talk about, when we talk about types of vaccines, how protection is provided and I'm sure you can guess from the last chapter somewhat of how this happens. So that's the history of vaccines uh, because the first vaccine for smallpox um, was kind of an accident it was hundreds of years later before we came up with the next vaccine, uh, which was for polio. And since then we have vaccines for all sorts of different diseases, and thank goodness we do. Now let's talk about the different vaccines and their characteristics. There are five types of vaccines that I want you to know for the exam. The book covers more of them, but I'm not going to test you on them. The first one is attenuated vaccines. The second one are inactivated or killed vaccines. The third one, subunit vaccines. The fourth one, toxoid vaccines. And then a brand new one, nucleic acid vaccines. Now let's talk about the characteristics of the different types of vaccines, starting with attenuated. Attenuated vaccines are also called live vaccines. It's where the pathogen is weakened, but it's still active. In the case of viruses, it's still alive when we inject them into you. Now, I'm going to use an analogy of domestication of dogs for how the attenuated vaccine works. Okay, dogs originally came from wolves. We have a picture of wolves running through the forest, and they're mean and, well, not mean, but they're able to hunt and they're able to bring down their own food and they can take care of themselves. Now, after thousands of years of domestication, we have Sadie the Chihuahua. Okay, if you took Sadie the Chihuahua and dropped her into the woods in the snow, she would last maybe a day if she was lucky. Okay, this is kind of what we've done with attenuated vaccines. Okay, the wild type pathogen is 
been living on its own, is used to evading your immune system, getting past your immune system and making you ill and getting out and making somebody else sick. Well, we take this pathogen, we grow it in the lab for multiple generations, and it gets used to the good life. We feed it, we keep it warm, it doesn't have to fight the immune system. It's thinking, why do I even have these genes for like a capsule or fimbre or different things? You know, why keep this if I'm not going to use it? Then we take it, plop it back into the woods, basically into your system, and our immune system goes womp. But you've stimulated your immune system and you have primed it for when the wolves come. Okay, and so your immune system is up and ready and knows how to tackle the attack. That's kind of what's happening. It's a good analogy anyway, for what happens with live or attenuated vaccines. Now, attenuated vaccines, nowadays we only use it for viral diseases. Um, and there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages for attenuated diseases. One of the advantages is you get a strong immune response. The reason why you get a strong immune response is the pathogen, the vaccine, replicates within the patient so your immune system is faced with a live active um, attack or challenge. And you have multiple antigens. So you have multiple B cells being stimulated by this. So you're not attacking just one antigen, but you're attacking multiple antigens. Also, especially with some of your gastrointestinal type diseases, like polio, uh, the relatives got a free booster. Um, you take the baby in to get the polio vaccine, they dribble the vaccine onto a sugar cube and the baby's all happy sucking on the sugar cube. And those viruses replicate within the baby's intestinal tract and some of it comes out in the messy diapers. Well, people aren't that careful when they change diapers and they pick it up themselves. They never get sick, but their immune system is stimulated by seeing this pathogen again. All right, on to the disadvantages. Unlike Sadie the Chihuahua, vaccine strains of pathogens can on rare occasion revert to wild type. And so you give a person a vaccine and they get the actual disease. Now this was less than 1%, okay? Um, and I'm pulling this data from the polio vaccine back when we used the live polio vaccine. This happened less than 1% of the time. And when you had polio out being circulated among people, that was a pretty low percentage. It was still better to get the vaccine and risk that less than 1% of actually getting polio. Now that we don't have polio around in the United States, less than 1% is still a high risk. So we don't use the live polio vaccine in the United States, so far as I know because of this tendency for it to revert to wild type. There's mutations that happen and they get those genes back that you thought that they'd tossed. It's more like getting a winter coat out. Okay, also free boosters to relatives. <laughs> People don't like this, <laughs> understandably. When you have in the home maybe somebody who's got a suppressed immune system, you want to be able to control who's being exposed to the vaccine. If you have somebody that really shouldn't be getting the vaccine, you don't want them to accidentally get it. Now the last disadvantage is most of these need refrigeration. So this isn't a problem in this country, but when you take some of these vaccines to highly rural areas, um, I'm thinking rural Africa, rural Southeastern Asia, um, rural South America, um, that becomes a problem when you don't have access to electricity. It becomes a problem in preserving the vaccines. Okay, those are the advantages and the disadvantage of the attenuated vaccine. Now on to inactivated vaccines. These are commonly called killed vaccines. This is where we take the pathogen and originally we would heat kill them but oftentimes now we put them in formalin. Remember that formalin is formaldehyde that's been watered down. And what do aldehydes do in infection control? They cross-link proteins. So you're killing the organism, but you're keeping the same shape of all the proteins. That becomes important when you're wanting to stimulate antibodies 
that are going to be active against the antigens of the wild type pathogen. So the advantages. There's no possibility of reversion to wild type. It's dead. It can't mutate. The next one is you have less need for refrigeration. So you can take this into rural areas where you don't have access to uh, municipal electricity and your vaccine remains effective. And it can be given to those patients who have weaker immune systems, those patients that wouldn't be a candidate for the attenuated vaccine, they can be given oftentimes an inactivated vaccine. Now, for the disadvantages, you have a lower immune response. Because the pathogen isn't replicating within your system, your immune system it doesn't take it as seriously. And so you have fewer memory cells produced and you have a lower immune response. Oftentimes the immune response is still plenty, but you are getting a less lesser immune response than you do from the attenuated vaccine. Also there's the possibility that you didn't kill all of them. There have been times when we thought that we were giving somebody a uh, inactivated vaccine and they were really getting an attenuated one because there was a problem at the factory. Um, because of this we never inactivate the wild type pathogen. We always inactivate the attenuated vaccine, the attenuated version. There's also the possibility of um, overdoing it, of denaturing the antigens and not getting the proper immune response. So basically you're getting stuck with a needle and you get no immune response. Now for an example. Um, I gave you an example of an attenuated vaccine, polio vaccine, which uh, we're not using anymore. Um, but let's talk about the influenza vaccine. Most of the times when you get the flu shot, it is inactivated. Now they can give you a live version of that. That's where you tip your head back and they squirt the syringe full of gunk up your nose. I hate that one personally. I'd much rather get a shot in the arm. But that is the live version and you have an attenuated version of the influenza virus. Most of us though get the inactivated version of influenza. So that's the advantages and the disadvantages of inactivated vaccines and that's at least one example. Gee, I, you know, you might want to be remembering these examples too. Now let's talk about subunit vaccines. That's where we take the pathogen, we find the most common antigens, the ones that you are um, going to develop an antibody response to that's going to shut down the disease fastest. And we take the genes for that and we put it into another microbe. Can be yeast, it can be E. coli, and we have them produce just the subunit. Now the advantages of doing this, you don't have to worry about under or overkill. Also it goes without saying, you have no possibility of getting the disease from this. Because there's no possibility of getting the disease for this, it's safe for immunocompromised patients. So if you have somebody who's got active AIDS, you can give them this. If you've got somebody who's just had a transplant um, and they're on immunosuppressive drugs so that they don't reject that transplanted organ, you can give them this subunit vaccine. Now, you also don't need refrigeration for subunit vaccines. Um, even more so than for the inactivated. And lastly, we can make vaccines of pathogens that we can't grow in the lab. Um, when I talk about an example, I'll talk about that some more. Now, disadvantages. You have a limited immune response. Because you're only presenting the antigens that we know about, you're only going to develop an immune response to that. So you have lower antibody levels. Okay, sometimes that's not a problem, sometimes it is. Also, if the pathogen mutates so that those antigens become a different shape, then you don't have backup antibodies to go against the pathogen. Okay, now let's talk about an example. Uh, hepatitis B is a subunit vaccine. Now, we cannot grow hepatitis B in the lab in tissue culture. We can only grow it in humans and that's not ethical or we can grow it in the great apes. Chimpanzees for many many years were the only ways that we could grow the, the virus to produce vaccines for humans. Now there's questions about whether that's ethical um, 
they were kept separated because you don't want them passing hepatitis from ape to ape. Um, and so it was not terribly good living conditions for a sociable creature like a chimpanzee. Um, also what they would do is they would get human volunteers in that uh, had uh, were chronic carriers for hepatitis B and they could pull viruses that didn't get done. And so um, they would have the main antigen, the hepatitis B surface antigen, um, in the blood, not a part of the virus, they would pull those out and you could take that and you could inject that as a vaccine. But you can see the problems with that. You're never quite sure that you don't have a real virus in there. So what we did is we took the gene from that, put it into another microbe, and now we make subunit vaccines in the lab from a pathogen that we can't grow. Okay, And you run no risk of getting hepatitis B when you get the hepatitis shots. So the benefits go on and on. The only problem is if we have a strain of hepatitis B that doesn't have those three or four antigens that we're immunizing you against, you're sorry out of luck. On to toxoid vaccines. We use this for diseases that are not caused by the pathogen replicating in you, but the disease is caused by toxins that the pathogen are producing. Examples of this are tetanus. Having the tetanus bacteria replicate in you is not a problem. Having the bacteria replicate in you and produce the tetanus toxin, that's a problem. Okay. Diphtheria is another example. Um, it's the production of the toxin that causes the disease. So what we do is we take the toxin, inactivate it with formalin, inject that, you produce neutralizing antibodies to the toxin, then you don't get sick when you're exposed to the bacteria that are producing the toxin, and you're able to fight off the replicating bacteria and not become ill from the toxin. Now the advantages are neutralization of the toxin that is producing the disease. Um, generally speaking, we don't have to refrigerate these, and there's really no disadvantages because toxoids are used specifically just for that purpose. So there's not another vaccine that we would use instead. Now the last one, the nucleic acid or naked DNA vaccines, are kind of a brand new one. What they do is they uh, take the gene for the antigen and instead of putting it into another microbe, they inject it into you. So remember back when I said eukaryotes couldn't do horizontal transfer of genes? Well, that's not necessarily true, but it takes extreme circumstances. So what happens is your skin cells are forced into taking up this DNA and they start producing antigens. Now these antigens are transported to the lymph nodes, to the bone marrow, and you produce antibodies against these antigens that are coded for by the DNA that we've injected into your cells. Isn't that just too cool? Now the advantages are no needles. We actually don't use needles for this. We use kind of an, a gun. You know, we put it up against you. It's kind of like an air gun. And so that's an advantage. Uh, you don't have to carry the needles around. You don't have to worry about disposal of the needles. You don't have to worry about sterilization of the needles. You just load the gun, fire it into the shoulder, and you have less possibility of transmitting disease from person to person um, other than the one you're vaccinating for. Uh, you have stimulation of T cells as well as B cells. Now we're really excited about this because with all the vaccines that I've talked about before this, you're only stimulating B cells. You're only getting an antibody response. Well, when you have diseases that pass from cell to cell or they're localized and they never hit the bloodstream, never hit the lymph, then antibodies don't help you that much. So in this way we're stimulating T cells as well as B cells. We've got a broader immune response. And you have a good extended Im immunological response. Uh, we're quite excited about this. Disadvantages, it's a new vaccine. So far we've only had two vaccines that have been approved by the FDA and one's for horses, one's for farmed salmon. That's all fine and good, but it's going to be years before they are used in humans. Okay, so don't hold your breath. Also, because it's brand new, we don't know the potential problems that may arise from this. 
So that's why we're trying it out in animals first. Basically we're extending the animal studies so that we can see what the problems are before we start using it in people. Now let's talk about the safety of vaccines. There's always going to be a risk in getting a vaccine. No vaccine is 100% safe. Um, as we went down the list of types of vaccines, you have uh, increased safety, um, but there's always going to be a problem with a s small percentage of the population. But when you consider the vaccine risk versus the disease risk, the safe bet is always with the vaccine. Uh, particularly with, um, lately we've had outbreaks of whooping cough here in Idaho and it's actually worse if you get whooping cough as an adult for the first time. The very young babies can die from it but you get into middle-aged folks, um, elderly getting whooping cough and you also have an increased mortality rate. It's just better to get the vaccine. The irony is with the reduced disease risk in the United States it's considered to be uh, you know, we see the risk of the vaccine more. Now, in countries like this where they still have active polio, we're getting it under control. Um, also in these countries we have um, active uh, endemic measles. Some of these things that we don't see a lot in this country and so we forget that in some of these countries, particularly in Africa, where you have endemic measles, uh, one child out of five under the age of five is going to die from measles. Now to me that would be unacceptable. I would much rather take the, the very, very, very low risk of a measles vaccine rather than risk losing, you know, 20 percent of my children. Um, part of the problem with the concern in the United States is because of its link to autism. There was a study done in Britain that linked vaccines with autism. Now, this particular physician that did the study, he did a couple of things wrong. One, he didn't have a very big study group. He was only looking at autistic children. He was not doing a comparative study with children who did not have autism that had received vaccines. Also, as it turns out, he was working for a company that was wanting to launch a pediatric um, mercury free line of vaccines. Well what happened is everybody came became afraid of vaccines for their children regardless of whether it had the thymerosal in it and there's been a reluctance to vaccinate children. Well we've had extended studies since then and as it turns out autism, at least with the current research, we're not done yet, autism is a complex disease, but it's looking like autism is probably coming from something that's happening during the last trimester of pregnancy and we don't know what it is but there's something that's happening then it's actually showing up in the children about the time that they're starting to get their vaccines so that's why it's been linked in people's minds um, unfortunately you know if I had a child and I didn't know this would I risk vaccination see I don't know if I would but it means that we're having outbreaks of these diseases that we pretty well had whipped up until this point. All right, enough about vaccines. Now we're going to talk about how we take the products of your immune system, specifically antibodies, and we diagnose disease. Basically, diagnostic immunology. We're going to talk about monoclonal antibodies, agglutination reactions, fluorescent antibody techniques, ELISA, Western blot, and what the future holds. Now the book talks about several other diagnostic immunology techniques, um, but they're going the way of the dodo bird, so I'm not going to test you on them. First, let's talk about how we get the antibodies to do the diagnostic testing. So what we do, and we call this monoclonal antibodies, because we want antibodies that are specific for just one antigen so that we can detect that antigen when we're doing diagnostic tests. So what we do is we take that antigen and we inject it into the mouse. Um, actually we usually take a pathogen and inject it into a mouse. Then we sacrifice the mouse, take the spleen, get the B cells, 
Okay. Then we take human cancer cells. They're immortal. They can divide and live forever in culture. They're very happy in the lab. And we fuse them with mouse cells. And what we do is we take those hybridomas, they're hybrid cancer cells. We take them, we separate them out, and then we test to see what antigens these hybridomas are producing. Then we proceed to grow these indefinitely in factories and they produce just one kind of antibody. From there comes diagnostic immunology, diagnosing diseases by means of monoclonal antibodies that are specific for just one pathogen and not just one pathogen, one part of a pathogen. So let's talk about one of the more common kinds of diagnostic immunology involving monoclonal antibodies and that's agglutination reactions. So we take and produce monoclonal antibodies that are specific for a certain antigen and it will clump cells and this makes it so that we can see whether these cells are what we're looking for. Here's an example. Blood typing. So what we do is we take monoclonal antibodies that are against the A antigen and we put them in a sample of a person's blood and we take antibodies that are against the B antigen put that in a sample of blood and the ones that have the blood cells that have the A antigen clump and we can see the clumping we don't even have to pull out a microscope we can look at that and say oh this person because we've taken the antibody we call it anti-A because it's the antibody against the A antigen is clumping those cells they're grabbing a hold here they're not grabbing a hold and so this person does not have B type blood okay if you are O you don't have either the A or the B antigen so nothing clumps. Here's another situation. Sometimes, like if we're looking to test for strep throat, streptococcus, the bacteria are too sp small. Even when they get clumped, they're still too small to see. Now we can break out a microscope and see if those bacterial cells are clumping, but it's easier to take the antibody, attach it to latex beads that are about the same size as the red blood cells. So when the antibodies, which are attached to the beads, attach to the bacteria, the beads clump. And we get something that looks like our blood type reaction. Okay, now we can also do this when we're looking for antibodies against a specific antigen. In this situation, we take our lovely latex beads, we per take the antigen uh, that we want to look for and see if our patient has antibodies against it. We put the patient blood in. If they have antibodies in the patient blood, they're going to grab a hold of the antigens on the latex beads and the latex beads are going to clump up. The uses go on and on and on. Now we've talked about fluorescent antibody testing. This is where we're going to go over it again now that you know about antibodies. Now there's direct staining. Okay, say I've got strep here, streptococcus. I produce monoclonal antibodies. I put a fluorescent stain on it. It attaches directly to the pathogen that I'm looking for. And I shine a UV light on it in a fluorescent microscope. And they light up. It's beautiful. Labeling all of these different monoclonal antibodies is kind of expensive. So what I can do instead, okay, this, this would be syphilis. So... I've got a sample, I want to see if there's syphilis in it, and I produce monoclonal antibodies against syphilis, syphilis, but I don't put a dye on it. They attach, now I take antibody that's got a dye that's specific for the human FC portion of human antibody. So then it attaches to the human antibody and it lights up under the microscope. This way I can use just one fluorescent labeled a stain that's against all of my different monoclonal antibodies as long as they are human or mouse. You know, if I've got a monoclonal antibody against um, mouse antibodies, so indirect, this would be indirect because I'm using two different antibodies, um, is a whole lot less expensive than direct uh, staining. Now we're going to talk about ELISA testing. In more detail, we introduced it in Chapter 10. Now we're going to tell you how it actually works. 
enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, we basically make an antibody antigen sandwich. So say I want to see if my patient is producing antigens for say hepatitis B. So I take some wells and I coat it with monoclonal antibody against hepatitis antigen. Then I add patient a patient serum sample and if they have antigens they're going to attach to the antibody. Now the book left out that the wells are washed after incubation between each step to remove anything that's unattached. If you don't wash it it's not going to work. So anything that's not attached gets washed out. Then I put another antibody okay, that's against the antigen and it's got an enzyme attached to it. Then I wash everything and then I put the substrate for the enzyme. So if the enzyme is there, the substrate turns from clear to, in this case, purple. Now, if the there's no antigen that matches this antibody, all I've got at the l end of this is the original antibody. I don't have the antibody with the enzyme because it's not going to attach. Now, this is an ELISA that's been run and you can see the positive wells are purple, the negative wells are clear. Now you notice some are lighter purple and some are darker. I can not only tell if it's positive, I can tell how much antigen is there. Isn't that just too cool? Now I can do the same thing but test for antibodies. Suppose I want, I've just given my employees the vaccines for hepatitis so I'm not worried about whether they're producing the antigen, i.e. that they're sick with hepatitis, but I want to see if they're seroconverted, if they're producing antibodies. So instead of putting the antibody against the antigen, I put the antigen down there and I do the same thing and I can see whether they're having a strong immune response or whether they're having kind of a wimpy one and maybe they ought to get another booster. Now ELISAs are all fine and good, and, but when we're setting these up we make them so that there's a certain number of false positives because we don't want any positives to get past us. We'd rather have false positives than false negatives. So what would happen back in the days when I was doing this kind of testing on a routine basis if somebody lit up with say antibodies um, to HIV. Then I would follow it up with a western blot test. It's more accurate um, and I can um, confirm that this patient actually is positive for producing antibodies for HIV. We call that being HIV positive. So what they do to, for a western blot, remembering back to chapter 10, I'm going to run a gel. So I take in this case, they talk about a lysed bacteria when I was testing, um, doing HIV testing. Uh, they would take the HIV virus that they grew in culture, lyse it so that we have the different antigens, and we would separate out the antigens on a polyacrylamide gel. So I put an electrical current across it, separate them out by size. Larger at the top, smaller at the bottom, because they have to wiggle through the gel. Now, the gel is kind of floppy. It's like a jello jiggler. So what we do is we transfer these antigens from the gel to nitrocellulose paper. It's basically paper. It attaches. I separate these. Then what I do is I take this and I use it as a confirmatory test because I'm looking at multiple antigens. So what I do is I take the patient sample that is lit up as positive on the ELISA, I run a western blot, and if I see that they have antibodies against all these antigens, then it confirms that they are positive for HIV. Whereas the ELISA, we're just looking at okay, the main antibody for the main antigen. Uh, this is a confirmatory test. Takes longer, it's not as quick as the ELISA, but it's more accurate. Now let's look at the future. Let's talk about the human pregnancy test. This is a rapid diagnostic immunology test that you can do in your own home. Extremely accurate, although you always follow it up by going to your doctor. What happens is, is it's kind of a cross between the ELISA and the Western blot. We have fixed antibody against the hormone that we're testing for, the hormones that increase when a woman becomes pregnant, and then we put a labeled antigen that's in the paper but it can move once the paper becomes wet. So you pee onto the little strip there, You the hormone is in the urine, it attaches to 
the fixed antibody. Then the floating antibody attaches to the antigen that it's looking for and darkens the strip. Now they've even got it that it can make a little positive versus a little negative. I have no idea how they get the negative. Maybe they're testing for an anim, um, a hormone that is high when you're not pregnant. But they're looking at using this for testing for something other than human pregnancy. What they're looking at doing is what they call bedside diagnostics, where a patient comes into the doctor's office, they say, oh, I'm not feeling so good. They give you a strip of paper to suck on, stick that into the machine, and using diagnostic rapid immunology, it says, yes, you have strep throat, and the strep is susceptible to penicillin, but we see that you're allergic to penicillin, so let's give you this different antibiotic. Oh, and by the way, um, you have high sugar levels. Are you diabetic, or did you just have a donut when you came in? So exciting things for the future. Okay, that's it for this chapter. Once again, come with questions. I'm more than happy to go over anything that you may have a little harder time with, that you want other examples, that you want me to explain it while I draw on the whiteboard. I'm happy to do that.